Hi, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Lauren Holmquist. I'm a second year, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I get the pleasure of giving the very first resident lecture of this year, so... Yay! Yay. <laughs> Especially good for me. I think the bar is the lowest it can be right now, so that's good. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus is... There's so much that can go wrong with it, obviously. But I'm going to just cover a few things. I want to talk about caustic injections, um, foreign bodies, which you'll see every day at Children's upper GI bleeding, and the indication and use of a Blakemore tube. Um, so I actually have a Blakemore tube, and I hope that we have time to kind of play with it, but we'll just see how our time permits. Um, so I'm going to cover quite a bit of questions in my talk. So audience participation is greatly appreciated, so I don't have to call on you. Um, so first question, who wants to read it for me? Please. 24-year-old male with HIV Thanks, presents with dysphagia and rhinophagia for one week. Physical examination reveals this image. What management is indicated? Um, you know, uh, so we can come back to the answer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, does everyone know what dysphagia and odynophagia mean? This is just kind of random, but... So dysphagia is uh, when someone's going to have difficulty in swallowing. So it's going to represent like an organic pathology of the esophagus. Oh, dinophagia is pain and swelling. So that's usually more of an inflammation or an infectious cause. And just in case you guys want one more picture to, to put in your memory, this is esophageal candidiasis. Um, so esophagitis is an inflammation of the esophagus. Uh, the mechanisms of how it occurs is usually due to infection. It can be allergy related, so eosinophilic esophagitis, or it can be from pills. Um, infections usually occur in the immunocompromised population. Um, so you're going to see in your diabetics, your alcoholics, people with underlying malignancy, those on chronic steroids or old patients. Um, so candida is the most common esophageal pathogen, and you always want to be very apprehensive when you see this. You should be always suspecting HIV or AIDS. And there's all those AIDS-defying illnesses, if you remember from medical school, but esophageal candidiasis is one of the most important ones. All right, so back to our question. Justin, you want to give me the answer? D. Very good. So fluconazole. So for an immunocompromised patient, you're going to want to treat for 14 to 21 days. Obviously, if the patient's really ill, they can't tolerate PO, you want to admit them and give them IV fluconazole. Um, and then, so the other answer is, if they're immunocompetent and if it's just very mild cases, you can give them the clotimazole atrocious. You can also have them do nystatin mouth swashes. All right, moving on to our next, our next topic. Who wants to read this for me? 37-year-old man who visited the ED immediately after ingestion ate after supply and suicide attempts. On exam, he complained of severe pain in his mouth, throat, his stomach, his vital signs. So I bolded the most important things for those of you who didn't want to read it. But keep, keep your answer in your mind. We'll come back to it. Okay, so caustic injury is really important. It's something we're going to see a lot. Uh, do you guys know what's worse? If you ingest a acid or a base, what's going to cause the most damage? Good job. Um, so acidic burns are actually more, are more important in the, in the stomach, whereas esophagus is uh, most commonly injured in alkali burns. So the most corrosive are obviously going to be the, um, the two ends of the spectrum, so the pH less than 2, pH more than 12. And then the degree of injury is going to also depend on the concentration of the substance, how much the person ingested, and then the duration of the mucosal contact. Um, so an alkali is going to form liquefactive necrosis, and this is actually worse because it stays in contact with the, um, with the tissue, so it doesn't just sloth off. But, so it's going to continue to cause injury as long as it's in contact, which is why it's so dangerous, whereas acidic causes coagulation necrosis and it almost forms like a plaque or an eschar, so it's going to limit the damage. So what you're going to do with these patients, most of them are going to be admitted, um, not unless they only took like one tiny little sip, but 
obviously with any patient or any problem you want to do your ABC so if their airways compromised you need to intubate them usually these patients are going to be admitted to at least observation they're going to have a EGD in the first 12 hours uh, you don't want to make them throw up that's just going to re-expose the esophagus to the caustic substance so it's something important to think about all right back to our question oops I give you the answer yeah endoscopy <laughs> sorry uh, so why don't we want to use charcoal anyone so charcoal only binds a few things um, so it's gonna be pointless and you don't want to dilute the substance so if you read actually the bottle of bleach I have used a lot of bleach this week uh, I have a lot of septic um, material in my basement from all this storm so I have gone through about 25 bottles of bleach and I read it and it said that you can dilute it with milk so if someone ingests the bleach you should be giving them milk or water and that's actually not good either uh, there's no damp there's no uh, value in it so you don't have to give them milk or water just ignore that um, you also don't want to neutralize it it causes some crazy chemical reaction and causes even more heat and it's going to worsen the injury um, so household bleach is actually pretty safe to ingest which is kind of funny to think about because um, it's a very dilute base there's obviously the more potent bleaches so that's what you always have to worry about um, and then so this is going to lead us on to our next talk we're going to talk very briefly about foreign bodies so this is something you're going to see almost on a daily basis at children's kids swallow everything next question anyone Do you know the answer? I can't hear. Go ahead, shout out. B. B. Very good. Um, and I think we've talked about the rest. So how you're going to know whether the coin is in the trachea or the esophagus is actually kind of important too, because you'll get a chest x-ray and you'll be like, oh wow, where is that? Um, so a coin in the esophagus, you're going to be able to see the whole like AP um, side of it, whereas the trachea is opposite. So it's always something important to think about when you're looking at these chest x-rays. So now we're going to transition into probably the more important part of this talk and what we'll see in the ED a lot, and it's always very dangerous, so we need to be prepared. Um, so a lot of upper GI bleeding can happen from the esophagus, right? So um, you're always going to want to be suspicious of this in the recess bay when you have a medical code. So any patient that comes in, if they're hypotensive, if they're tachycardic, if they could present with angina or syncope, uh, they could be weak or confused, they could also present in the extreme of cardiac arrest. And I feel like as I've gotten like later on in this residency, I've been finding myself doing more and more rectals in the recess bay. Uh, so it's always something important to think about. Uh, this table is from Rosen's. You guys can read it at your leisure elsewhere. Oops. Um, so we're going to talk about a few things of upper GI bleeding in adults. Um, just listed on here as the common causes of both children and adults in upper and lower GI bleeding. But we'll focus on the upper GI bleeding. Anyone? Do you know the answer? Yeah, very good. Uh, so Mallory Weiss tears usually occur after a very forceful bout of emesis or even coughing. Um, the lesion goes through the mucosa and the submucosa, so it's very superficial. It's usually about one to four centimeters. Um, so most of them occur in the stomach, but about 25% of them occur in the gastroesophageal junction. Um, it's usually very mild and self-limited, but it is important because 3% of deaths from upper GI bleeding are the result of a malarial waste tear. 
And so on a more extreme version of this, so we've got Borheve syndrome. So Borheve syndrome is perforation of all the layers of the esophagus. Um, the esophagus is kind of unique in that it lacks a serosal layer. So as soon as something perforates through it, you have immediate, immediate contamination of the mediastinum with anything that was in the esophagus. So these patients can get real sick real fast. Um, it's a surgical emergency. You gotta get surgery on board right away. Uh, the mortality rate is 50% if surgery is not performed within 24 hours. Um, so usually spontaneous rupture from something like Borheves usually occurs in the distal third of the esophagus, whereas if you see something in the up upper part of the esophagus, you're going to want to think about traumatic injury. So how are these patients going to present? Um, they can present very, very acutely ill. Um, they can have neck and chest pain, they can have dysphagia, they can be in respiratory distress. They could also just have fever. Um, or dinophagia, they could be vomiting, their voice could also change. So if you see someone that has like a really hoarse voice, you wanna make sure that you ask if this is their normal voice. Um, so kind of the common thing is you're gonna see subcutaneous air in the tissue, so you're gonna have the mediastinal crunch, which is called Hammond sign. How we're gonna diagnose is a chest x-ray, and then if we wanna know even more, we're gonna get a esophagram. So when you see these patients right away, you gotta start them on broad spectrum antibiotics. You need to get surgery involved. So this is a close up of the chest x-ray. As you can see over on the right uh, border, you've got mediastinal air. So Mackler's triad is something that I didn't hear, I didn't know before I started this talk. It's very, very pathognomonic of Borheve syndrome, but unfortunately occurs in about 50% of cases. So you're gonna see lower chest pain, vomiting, and subcutaneous emphysema. I'm sorry, these questions are so long. Someone else want to read this? Or we can just read the bolded. So a 53-year-old man presents to the ED with antitemesis. PMS competition is home lying on the surrounded by top ground emesis. On arrival to the ED, his BP was 70 over 40, heart rate is 125, temperature is 38.7, respiratory rate is 22, and O2 saturation is 95% on room air. Physical exam shows that the steady abdomen with engorged veins around the umbilicus. The patient is intubated for airway protection, and IV is started with rapid infusion of normal saline and you contact the blood bank for low positive blood and fresh frozen plasma. The patient's medical record shows he has a history of alcohol abuse with known esophageal varices. Which of the following medications is the most appropriate to administer meds? Let's see. Good job. So do you know what octreotitis? It's an analog to somatics. Yep. Yeah. Um, so how it works is it inhibits the exocrine function of these glandular tissues. It's going to result in less acid and pepsin secretion. Um, and then in the setting of an upper GI bleed, it's going to reduce the gastroduodenal mucosal blood flow. So that's going to facilitate your hemostasis. Um, does anyone know when we would use ceftriaxone? No? Okay. Um, so ceftriaxone is actually is used more of a prophylactic therapy, so once you get these patients stabilized, um, you would commonly put them on ceftriaxone. Uh, erythromycin is a motilin receptor agonist. Uh, it's going to accelerate the gastric emptying, so when you would use this is if the patient was going for emergency endoscopy, you could actually give them erythromycin to empty all the old blood and stuff from their stomach. And then propanolol is used more of a chronic management, not an acute therapy. So it's a non-selective beta blocker. It's gonna decrease the hepatic venous pressure gradient in these patients. And it's been shown to reduce the risk of first time variceal hemorrhage. Um, so whenever you see someone with cirrhosis or they look like they have, they, could, they might have varices, that's why they might be on propanolol. Uh, so just a diagram about what you're gonna go through in an upper GI bleed. Uh, like I said before, obviously ABCs. And then you need to get these patients to endoscopy right away. So either call GI, call surgery. Um, so esophageal varices, these look terrifying to me. But they're from portal hypertension. Uh, mostly it's from alcoholic liver disease in the United States. So they count for about 7% of all cases of upper GI bleeding. So it doesn't seem like that much, but 
The scary thing about them is that they're very prone to re-bleeding and they can carry a 16% mortality rate. So at this time, I thought we could talk about using a Blakemore tube. This is something that I always like just read about and I had no idea where to find one or where to use one. And we actually have one in the recess bay now. I believe Brian Holowicki got it last year and he put it down there. Uh, I was able to get one from Central Supply. I have no idea how. It just appeared to me yesterday. So I'm glad I was able to use it or got get it. Oh. <laughs> All right. So this is what it looks like. We've got two ends. One goes in the stomach. One goes outside, obviously. Um, did anyone watch the video that I sent yesterday? Maybe. Uh, so it's about 10 minutes long. I thought just the first few minutes might be helpful. Setting these things up is like very complicated and I don't think I could do a very good job explaining it. So I thought we could watch a few minutes of it just so we understand how to set it up. But there's like a lot of things other than this that you need to use. Um, but so when are we gonna use this? It is very unlikely that you'll ever use one. Hopefully, well, if these patients ever are getting one, they're probably gonna die anyways. But they also have a lot of adverse reactions. They're like very dangerous to use. Um, they can cause ulceration of all the mucosa layers. They can cause esophageal or gastric rupture. You're gonna get like multiple chest x-rays during the process of inserting this basically so you don't rupture the stomach, and which was really scary to me. Um, these balloons can become dislodged in the patient because they're not like, they don't seem very tough and you're gonna be putting a lot of pressure in these things. Um, they can cause tracheal compression and obviously aspiration, so. But they're life-saving, so hopefully we never have to use it though. And they can be inserted nasally or through the trachea. So it's always something to think about. Usually these patients are gonna be intubated before you even attempt to do this anyways. Um, so this is just the kind of layout of it. The sun's obviously gonna go in the patient. And then usually they have four ports on the end. There's a, a balloon port and a aspiration port for both the stomach and the esophagus. Um, ours have just two. So you're gonna use the esophagus and the uh, gastric balloon for both aspirating and, inf in and um, pumping it with air. So let's see if this video works. All right, so step one, we do the setup. So this is the crap you need. When and this website that I sent out has all the lists of things that you'll these ever need. These are ridiculous. If this has been sitting here for any length of time, they get wedged in there and you can't get them out. And this one I had already pre-loosened, but sometimes they're really jammed in there. And, and if that's the case, you're going to be already really upset because your patient's crapping out. you got to wedge a small Kelly in between that plug and the Blakemore and run it around 360 degrees, and then the plugs will come out. And what you want to do is... You want to mark two spots on the Salem sump. You want to mark about a couple centimeters above the uh, gastric balloon, and you mark that at the 50 centimeter mark on the Blakemore. And so we'll mark that, and we'll call it gastric. And then you want a couple of centimeters above the esophageal balloon. And again, you mark that at 50 on the Blakemore, and we'll call that esophageal. All right, so now I got one mark that says esophagus. I got another mark that says gastric. All right, so you have the one with the one three-way stopcock on the Christmas tree adapter, with a saline lock cap there. And that one goes into the gastric port. I'm gonna wedge that in, nice and tight. It doesn't need to come out. And then you can have another one with a Christmas tree adapter, two three-way stopcocks, and a uh, cap on it. That's gonna go into the esophageal balloon. I'm not sure where we where to find these in our ED. Now we can test the gastric. This is all I 250 can find. cc's of air, and just for the sake of this demonstration, we'll just do it twice. So you have to sit here and wait. And you want to make sure the balloon is not leaking. 
then fully deflate that gastric port. To the point where it's totally involuted. Then we'll test out the gas, the uh, esophageal balloon. This one only needs about 70 cc's air total. So we'll test it with like 80 or 90. Looks good. Now we'll fully deflate that one. So now that one's totally flat. All right. Now we're going to lube the hell out of it. Get the balloons too. Okay. All right. So now we're actually ready to insert the blade more. Now, this just goes in like an NG tube. If you have any problems, use a laryngoscope to help you get that stuff out of the way. But you're just going to come in. You'd obviously be wearing gloves. Insert until you get to 50 centimeters at the lips. And make sure the markings are facing the patient's right. That just orients the balloon properly. So 50 centimeters, and then you're going to check if it's in the stomach. Okay, once you think you have it in, now what you want to do is actually uh, get your slip syringe and insufflate through the gastric lavage port while someone auscultates over the stomach and then do it again while they auscultate over the lungs and make sure it's in the stomach. And uh, sometimes they'll even hook up the entitled CO2 to it temporarily and give a couple breaths and make sure there's no entitled CO2 coming back either. This tells me at the very least it's not in the lung. We're going to put 50 cc's of gas into the gastric balloon, just to keep it there from popping back out. So we'll come on over to this port, we'll turn it away from the patient. We'll just put in 50 cc's. And we'll turn it off to the patient. Now we're going to get an x-ray and make sure that balloon is sitting below the patient's diaphragm in the stomach before we do any further Once we've confirmed by x-ray, we'll come back to the gastric port. And now we're going to put another 200 cc's of gas in for a total of 250. So that seems like a lot to go in this tiny little balloon, huh? Two more. This should go in nice and easy. and then turn it off to the patient. Okay. All right, so we got 250 cc's of gas in there. Now we want to apply traction. So you start pulling this out until it starts wedging against the esophageal gastric junction. Then you're actually going to apply traction onto the blade more itself. The way to do that is you just open up your curlex and you know, you're going to make one of those slip knots. Pull that tight. I'm just going to skip through some of this in the matter of time, but you're going to basically attach this acrylics to a one liter normal saline bag, and it's equivalent to one kilogram of pressure. And then if you just hang it over an IV pole, it works great to apply this traction. You're now going to mark it where it pops out at the level of the Now they're going to show us how to black mark there. blow now, up the esophageal balloon. as the comes up, it might move out a little Hopefully. bit, but if it's moving more than just an inch or so, then you gotta be worried it's actually pulling out through the GE junction. The patient has a hiatal hernia, you gotta get an x-ray. So now, what we can do is first put on suction to this distal port, it's marked uh, gastric aspirate. We can suck out all the blood. And so we get all that blood out. Once that's all out, now we'll lavage with some saline really wash out the stomach and suck again and see if there's any active bleeding coming from below that balloon. Now, at this point, we want to see if there's any bleeding from above. So we have our pre-marked Salem sunk, and we're going to advance this to that mark we put for gastric right there, just alongside 
the Blakemore. We'll put that on suction as well to see if there's any active bleeding now coming from the esophagus. Now, and we secure that obviously. Now, if there's no bleeding, then we'll just let this sit until either endoscopy comes or the patient gets tips. But let's say they're still bleeding, endoscopy has either told us they can't do anything or um, they, uh, they haven't arrived yet. You got one of is you got to get a stigma monometer. And now ours happily fits into a saline lock. So this is going to inflate like the so. esophageal balloon. And the way we have this configured is this is now facing away from the patient. So this port is open. And now we're going to put this port so it's open all three ways. And now... Basically you just blow it up until there's 45 milliequivalents or millimeters of mercury in there. I and use this same thing for... Uh, I'm going to leave... We'll leave you in suspense for the rest. You'll have to watch it because we're running out of time. And now I lost my place. Okay. So what if this fails? Then you would probably just panic or hope that this patient's outside of your ED. Um, but if it doesn't work, you're going to want to get them to IR as fast as you can, and they're going to need the TIPS procedure. So take home points. The esophagus is important. Um, we always ask about chest pain. We see a ton of patients with chest pain. And we all learn the six main causes of really bad chest pain that can be life-threatening. Um, very important test question. But it's always important to consider the esophagus whenever you're asking or you're seeing a patient with ch chest pain. Um, just ask, or not ask, but just think about their esophagus. And, and that's it.